I want to read this morning a very brief scripture and a rather unusual scripture. I want to read first the sixth chapter of Romans, verse 14, and then begin reading at chapter 7 of Romans, because these are vitally and logically connected. And I would like to read them by changing probably just a little, not the meaning, but in order to get at the meaning. He says here, For you are not under the principle of law, but under the principle of grace. And then he begins by saying, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the principle of law, but under the principle of grace. And then the translators of the authorized left out a very important word in beginning chapter 7, and the American Standard has included it. Are know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members, to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Our subject this morning sounds sensational. They shoot husbands, don't they? And before we are through, I'm afraid you'll say they ought to shoot grandpas also. When a man begins to recall incidents which took place in his boyhood and recount them to others, it's a sign of old age and approaching senility. This morning... I wish to tell you of an incident took pla which took place when I was a boy, about 10 or 12, I, somewhere in there. We lived in a little town in southern Oklahoma. The name of the town is Springer, and I understand it's still in existence and is now a filling station on a highway. It was then ten miles from the railroad, and only a winding dirt road led to the town. I've only met one person in my life that knew where it was, and that was a lady up in Arkansas a few months ago, and she said she had lived there also in her youth. Well, there were quite a few characters that lived there in my day. It was a little town. There was a rancher there. He was a heavy drinker. He was profane and vulgar, and he was despised by those in the town, and yet they feared him. And one of the things that he would do, he would get drunk and lock his wife in a little house that was on his ranch and was like a prison. And then he would ride off with other women. And you can be sure the little town hated him. But one Sunday evening, and he had been on a drunk for several days, why, his wife 
got out of this place. Her father, we were told, helped her escape, and he gave her a gun. And that Sunday evening, some of us boys were coming from the little church, for that was the only thing open on Sunday night in the town. And we were coming from the church, and we heard a shot. And we ran to see what it was, and we saw coming around one of the stowers, and there weren't but three or four of them there, but this man came running around, or at least he was walking, we were running, and his vest, he wore a gaudy vest to begin with, and it was ablaze. He had been shot. He walked across a vacant field down to where a doctor lived, and a crowd gathered. In that crowd was his wife. She still held the gun, and she made the statement, if he lives, I'll go in and kill him. And in a few moments, the doctor came out and announced that he was dead. And some in that little town felt that she was justified. Others felt that she should have let the law take its course, but all agreed that he got what was coming to him. They shoot husbands, don't they? And it's still open season on husbands, for you read every now and then of a wife that shoots a husband today. Now, Paul uses a striking illustration to catch the attention of discouraged and careless Christians to convey one of the greatest spiritual truths for us today, and he uses something along the same line. And the great truth that he's illustrating is he's putting down here the principle for Christian living, and that's so desperately needed today. And here are the two verses that have been so abused today, for they've been lifted out of their context, and there is a lesson drawn that Paul was not attempting to illustrate at all. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, we have today some extreme separationists and legalists, and they find here a cold, hard, and unyielding rule for divorce, or rather, that divorce is not permitted on any grounds whatsoever, and that the only thing that breaks the marriage vow would be death. And I have to say that if that is true, then the thing that is left then to some wives today then would be to get a gun and to do what the woman in Oklahoma did. May I say to you that if that is the interpretation of this passage, then it would contradict the words of the Lord Jesus, who made it very clear that there was grounds for divorce. For in the 19th chapter of Matthew, verse 9, he says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery." So that he says there is a grounds for divorce. And the way these folk interpret this, that there is no grounds for divorce. But actually Paul was not discussing that here. What he's talking about, he's discussing the basis for divorce as an illustration, and it's based on marriage and divorce under law, and you have no right to interpret this unless you go back and see what the Mosaic system actually said about marriage and divorce. 
And believe me, it was rather harsh. Will you listen to it? I'm turning back to the 22nd chapter of Deuteronomy, and I'd like to read these verses because some folk come up with some very peculiar interpretations of Scripture today. If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city, and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. So you see that when Paul says that if the husband is alive, but under law, he wouldn't be alive. He would have been stoned to death. And they don't do that today. If they did that in Southern California, most of you would not have been able to get in to the church this morning because of the rock piles on the freeway. May I say, they don't stone them to death today. And when a woman had an unfaithful husband or vice versa in that day, then that one was stoned to death. And so you don't have the type of illustration that some of these extremists draw today. But let's get back now to the great principle of Christian living that's illustrated here, and the devil's always trying to detour us away from that. Again, I'd like to read the verse I read first. For sin shall not have dominion over you. He's writing to believers. For ye are not under the principle of law, but you are under the principle of grace. And in the rest of chapter 6, he explains what it means to be under the principle of grace. And then, in chapter 7, he shows why we are not under law today to live the Christian life. For you see that we are not only saved by grace, we're to live by grace. Law hasn't anything to do with our salvation, and it hasn't anything to do with our sanctification. And here is where, of course, there is a great deal of difference of opinion today. And what Paul is saying here is that the law represents here, that which is set forth in a husband. And actually, that husband, as we'll see in a moment, and that always has been the big question here, who is this first husband? And we'll attempt to identify him in just a moment. But you see, the law was never used to save us. fact of the matter is, the law does not remove sin. It reveals man is a sinner. And the law was given to control the old flesh, the old nature. But it never did it. Paul said in the 8th chapter of Romans, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is good. But there's a great deal wrong with man. Man is totally depraved. We today, or most of us, are living in a world of illusion. We compare ourselves to folks around us. We get up and go to work and see things around us, and we are interested in the money that we make today in our bank account and our friends and those things that are at our fingertips today, and it all looks very comfortable in this affluent society. We're living in a world of illusion when even we may be on the way to hell today because we're a lost sinner. Dream stuff is the thing that's about multitudes of people today. Now, God demands more 
than man can supply. Man's unable today, and he's incapable of meeting the demands of God. He can't do it. And therefore, God supplies for him a righteousness. The other evening, Thursday evening, when we began this study in Romans, I used this verse, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For therein is a righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The gospel reveals a righteousness, and it's not man's righteousness. It's not even like man's righteousness. It's not even the same kind of righteousness that's a little bit better than man's righteousness. It's not man's at all. It's utterly and profoundly different as to its content, as to its kind, as to its source, as to its aim, as to its scope, and as to its quality. Man's righteousness is inferior to God's righteousness, but it's a different kind altogether. Let me illustrate this, and I used this the other night rather hurriedly. Today we're told in physics that cold and heat are really the same thing. And God's righteousness and man's righteousness are not just two phases of the same thing. Let me illustrate what I mean by the hot and cold. I visited a man in the hospital several years ago. He was dying. First thing he said to me, he said, Pastor, can't you get them to turn on the heat? He said, I am freezing to death. And he was. And I was perspiring. I have never been in a room so hot. You see, to him the room was cold. To me, the room was hot. It's the same thing. You see, that's a relative term. Now, if man only builds up a supply of righteousness, which a great many people think that they can do, that if he gets enough of it, he'll be acceptable to God. If God wants a hundred percent or almost a hundred percent, so man has two percent to present, and so man's going to work on that. And I would say today that we have it divided, something like that. There are people that say, well, now, here's the criminal. Oh, he's not all bad. He's got some good in him. The little graffiti goes like this. There's so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us that it behooves most of us not to talk about the rest of us. Well, there's a certain amount of truth in that, but actually that criminal has two percent of righteousness. He's the bottom man on the totem pole. And then we come to the average man. Let's give him fifteen percent. And I think we ought to give the church member a little bit more. He's got fifty percent of righteousness. And then let's give the deacons 80 percent. And there are a lot of people today in the church who think they're going to make heaven on their own. My friend, God doesn't save like that. Suppose God set a standard that only a few could meet today. He'd be unjust. Suppose that today God said he'd only save the intelligent, and then we'd have an IQ test, find out who'd be saved. Be bad on the morons. Suppose God would say he'd only save those who had a certain bank account. You'd have to be rich. Then those that are paupers would have a problem. And suppose that he said it depended if you had a little moral righteousness, a little human goodness. What about the man with a bad heredity who inherited a desire to drink? and he has the weakness of his ancestors and a bad environment, 
he can't be saved by moral goodness. And God would be unfair. And my friend, God is not unfair. He has said, listen to him, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Paul said to the Ephesians, By grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then Paul right here in Romans in the fourth chapter says, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then God has written man's righteousness off in the Old Testament. He says the righteousness of man is filthy rags in his sight. God demands what man cannot supply. He doesn't have any of it. And that would be God's perfections. How in the world can God be righteous and take a sinner and make that sinner as righteous as he is and bring him into heaven? And if it depended on you or on me this morning, we'd never make it. Thank God what he demands he supplies as a free gift. And today he, he doesn't ask you to make yourself better. You offer God nothing. The reason we sing the hymn at the Lord's Supper, I put, adopted that because it's meant so much to me. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And you and I do nothing to draw God's attention to ourselves. I get a little weary today of hearing folk who give testimonies, and it's almost like saying, Look, Lord, look at me. And we preen ourselves and walk up and down and say, Look what I've done. My friend, you do nothing to draw God's attention to you. There were three men hanging out in space all last week, astronauts. Everything was going well, and there were a nice few little wisecracks made back and forth. Then all of a sudden, there was an explosion And then man found out how helpless he really is. And those men were lost, and I mean lost. But down yonder in Houston, Texas, was a space team that went into emergency. Men who knew this and who knew those vehicles, and they worked out a plan and program to bring out a face those three men. And I take off my hat to them. What a tremendous thing they did. My friend, this morning, mankind is today hanging out in space in a little space vehicle called the Earth. And there's been an explosion on board. Man's sin. And he lost contact with his Creator. And he's lost in space, dead in trespasses and sins. Not a chance. And then the God of heaven. They'd already had their emergency. They were prepared for it. And God the Father sent God the Son down to this earth to die on the cross. And God the Holy Spirit came to make it effective. 
And to say to man, there is a little lamb that you can get in. And you can live. You will die if you stay like you are in the world. But there is a lamb for you to get in. And that lamb is Christ. And if you're in him, you're coming home safe. And man is not asked to do anything but just to believe God. And he takes you and me and he puts us in Christ. That's what Paul meant in Romans 6. Buried with him in baptism in identification, now raised with him in newness of life and joined to a living Christ. That's the position of man today And that's where man is at the present hour. Christ took my place down here on the cross. When there stood before me judgment and death, he came down and bore that and removed that out of the way. He took my place that I might take his place. And today I am in Christ and only accepted in the Beloved, and God sees us in Christ. And you don't improve on that. He has to have 100% perfection. I don't have it. But there is a little lamb. Well, he's a big lamb for us to get in, and that's in Christ, and God sees us in Christ today. Now let's see what Paul is saying here. We are saved by grace. We're to live by grace. And we're not under law. How do we get out from and under law? Listen to this again. For the woman, which hath a husband, is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law, so that she's no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, what we have here is something I think quite remarkable. Who is that first husband? This difference of opinion. Some think it's the law, could be. Some say... and. Dr. Newell, in particular, says that it's Adam. I agree with that. You and I are identified in Adam. In Adam all die. By one man's transgression, all were made sinners. When Christ died, he not only died for my sins, he died for me as a sinner. And when he died for me as a sinner, I'm buried with him, raised with him, joined to a living Christ. And when I did that, I died to Adam. And the law was given to control that old Adam. Therefore, I'm no longer bound to the first husband. He's dead. Dead. Let's bury him. And now we are joined to the living one, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to illustrate that, and it's a very, I would say, homely illustration. When I was a student in Columbia Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, this was a story that was reported as true, having happened. It goes back to antebellum days before the Civil War. There lived on a plantation in Georgia a very wonderful man, outstanding man. And he had a very lovely and beautiful wife, and they were very much attached to each other. They loved each other. And he took sick and died. It was sudden, heartbreaking to her, and she did a very morbid thing. She did not bury him. She had him embalmed, sealed in a glass case, sitting in a chair, and put him in the great hallway of this great southern home, so that when you entered the door, there he sat. 
Well, her friends knew that that couldn't go on. And they finally persuaded her to travel. And she had relatives in Pennsylvania, and so they got her to go up there. She went up there, visited, and then there were those that were taking a trip to Europe, and they invited her, and she made a trip to Europe. She was gone for about two years. And in that two years, she met another man. And he proposed to her. And she accepted him, and they were married. And they decided to go on their honeymoon to the south to this plantation home. And when they came there, he did what a bridegroom generally does. He picked up his bride in his arms, he pushed the door, and then put her down. And when he put her down, he looked over and saw a man looking at him in a glass cave. And he said, who is that? And she said, oh, my, she'd forgotten all about the first husband. She says, oh, my, that's my first husband. You know what he did? He called for the workers. He said, we're going to bury him. He didn't want him sitting around there watching him. He buried him. That's a ridiculous story, I grant you. I sometimes wonder whether it really ever happened or not. My friend, it may not have happened back yonder, but I know a lot of folk today in the church that are doing that ridiculous thing. They have come to Christ. They've trusted Him as Savior. And when they were, they are now identified with the living Christ. And you know what they do? They go dig up the law that was given to Adam, and they say, I'm going to be under the law. My friend, and I say it this morning reverently, why don't you shoot that husband? If you don't think he's dead, shoot him. You're dead to the law. That's what Paul is saying. And now we are joined to a living Christ where he says now this, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Someone has called this the explosive power of a new affection, and now we belong to Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's a new way of living. It's as different as when a girl gets married. Before she lived one kind of life, now she's married, she's living another kind of life altogether. And now, we're not under the law. The Lord Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he has some, by the way. And we please Christ now because we are joined to him, we know him, and we love him. There is a popular cliché today. I've heard it, heard it the other night in San Diego, my commitment to Christ. I don't want to be ugly this morning, but I wouldn't give you three cents for your commitment to Christ, because I wouldn't trust you, and he won't trust me. This is the question, what is your relationship to Christ? What's your relationship? We're hearing a great deal today. We've got to relate, all right? Are you related to Christ today? Can you say this morning, I know him, I love him, and I do want to serve him? I don't care about your commitment. That's you. What about identification? We hear that today. I want to identify. 
Get someone to identify with that will bring you all the way to heaven and deliver you from hell. Identified with him. Oh, we've got so much today that's so phony in Christian living. There's been a phony revival in some of the colleges today. I heard so much about it in Florida, and it's, it's as flat as a pancake today. Some preachers were trying to work it up, get people to confess and commit themselves. My friend, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. It's not what you say. The fact of the matter is, he has something to tell us even about that. It's not what I say. Will you listen to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4? And this is not the passage about his rapture. It's about our relationship to him right down here. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. You want to read some of those commandments? It cuts right across the new morality today. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. Don't tell me today that the new morality, that Jesus approves of it. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And these are my commandments, he says. That's not all. He says in verse 11, and that ye study to be quiet. We have all kinds of schools today to teach people how to talk. We don't have one to teach them how to keep quiet. Someone has said, if those who have nothing to say would refrain from saying it, be a much better world today. May I say to you, we talk about obeying him today. It's not by some little rules and regulations that we fundamentally set up. The question today is not a formula, not gimmicks today. It's not even consecration. I'm a little weary of that word. You can't consecrate anything. We come to him with empty hands. And that's all it ever meant in the Old Testament. We come to him and say, oh God. I come with nothing. You give me everything. That's what it means to obey him. There are those today that it's rather amusing. They say, oh, I'm disappointed in myself. Are you? Well, if you are, it means that you must have believed in yourself. He didn't. He said he's expecting nothing of you. He would love to do something in and through you. And the condition is, the bride in the Song of Solomon said, I am his, and he is mine. We love him because he first loved us. Then there are those that are saying today, I'm discouraged. Well, that means you really don't believe God's Word, do you? And you don't believe that His way of blessing is the only way that'll work. And then there are those who say, I hope to do better. Well, you really do expect something out of yourself, don't you? Why don't you declare yourself bankrupt and go to Him for salvation if you have not really trusted Him? And if you have, you love him today. And if you love him, you'll obey him. You'll want to obey him. Oh, there's so little today, really, really living for him. Several years ago, Sir Ernest Shackleton put an advertisement in the London paper, he was the Antarctic explorer. He was getting ready to set out on one of those epic expeditions, and his advertisement read like this, Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, 
constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognitions in case of success. And all over England, man responded to that, and he had to turn them away. And then in the church today, if they make one little sacrifice, you can hear them crying to high heaven. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are under the principle of grace, and you're not under the principle of law. Are you living today the Christian life? He not only saved us from the penalty of sin, he saves us from the power of sin. And someday he'll save us from the presence of sin. We ought to be living for it. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, We pray this morning we may come your way, not our way. We pray this morning we may learn that great fact that there's nothing in us, nothing, that we are as helpless as those men were in space. But, oh, God, help us to make contact with a Savior that came down to draw us to himself and give us a love in our heart for him. Help us to see today it's not rules and regulations, but it's a relationship. Draw us to him today. For we pray in his name, amen.